Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night. Thank you for joining us for the Trimark webcast. Uh, we'll get started in a few more minutes, or actually just a couple more minutes. I just want to note that we'll be uh, taking August off for our, the Trimark webcast, so we will be back online uh, doing a webcast on Wednesday, September 23rd from 1 to 2 p.m. at Eastern Time. And we'll be talking about when Active Directory is compromised. Uh, this is what uh, effectively happens during a compromise. How do attackers uh, typically breach Active Directory, gain access, and ultimately compromise it? And then what to expect? Uh, certainly your first action should be reaching out to a qualified, reputable incident response company, uh, but what to expect through that process? Uh, so I'm going to talk through my experience in uh, working and assisting customers through a breach recovery and what that typically looks like uh, so that you can prepare and have some ideas uh, if you find yourself in that sort of difficult situation. But uh, as I said, I'll get started in just a couple minutes. Thank you for joining us for the Trimark webcast. This is the July edition. Uh, I'm Sean Metcalf. I'm going to be talking about uh, Active Directory security and how you can best protect your Active Directory administrators and the administrative accounts. Uh, first, I want to talk about what Trimark does. We primarily provide security assessments. This is a comprehensive review where we provide detailed and actionable recommendations, effectively a roadmap to help you better improve your security posture. Uh, we have several different security assessments that we have uh, that we offer to customers today. That includes our Active Directory security assessment, our Microsoft Cloud security assessment, uh, which focuses on Office 365 and Azure Active Directory, uh, VMware, uh, our VMware infrastructure security assessment. And I'm going to cover just a couple of those uh, quickly and then we'll get started into the presentation. So our Active Directory security assessment is an extremely comprehensive Active Directory focused security assessment. We cover all the key areas that attackers would review and scan uh, in order to potentially leverage uh, and compromise Active Directory. During this assessment, we use a proprietary Trimark developed assessment tool to quickly identify issues. Uh, when then the Trimark personnel review the gathered AD data to identify any other potential issues in the environment. Our goal is to find all potential escalation paths in the AD forest and provide detailed and actionable remediation items. And during this reporting process, we provide extensive internal review of the report to help identify additional security issues. Uh, mo probably most importantly, every person who works on the engagement uh, from Trimark uh, has at least 10 years or more in operations. And then we combine this with our security vision, which means we're able to provide detailed recommendations that can be used in order to resolve your identified issues. And they're actionable and they're feasible. Uh, this fall, we are la launching a lighter version of our Active Directory Security Assessment for small single domain forests. Uh, so this is a quicker engagement. It's two weeks. The focus is on smaller organizations with single domain AD forests who still want an AD review with the Trimark recommendations. Uh, this timeline is shorter since we don't go as in depth with AD permissions and don't review domain controller configuration at the same level of detail. Uh, the great thing about this new Trimark ADSR is that we don't require access to the network. Uh, instead, we provide a PowerShell script to get the required data, and the entire engagement is performed offline, takes about two weeks to review and analyze the data and write the report. Uh, we're initially looking to deliver this offering to nonprofit organizations and those companies who are looking to be acquired for M&A. Uh, so we're launching this uh, this fall. Um, so monitor the Trimark Twitter account and uh, as well as the website for more information, or you can reach out to us and we can talk about it. And as I mentioned, we also have the Trimark Virtual Infrastructure Security Assessment, or VISA. Uh, this is a thorough evaluation of your 
VMware infrastructure environment. So ESXi hosts vCenter servers, virtual machine configuration as well. Uh, we only need global read privileges uh, for each of the vCenter environments that we're looking at. Uh, ultimately, all of the Trimark engagements, our goal is to only use read access to look at the environment. And we provide recommendations uh, for additional beneficial security controls for your existing license levels. So one of the things about uh, security, especially in the corporate space, is that you have pen tests, you have red teams against the environment. Oftentimes they look at Active Directory, they look at Windows systems, applications, but the VMware environment is one of those things that's often missed. And yet VMware is the thing, that infrastructure, that pretty much everything else re uh, resides on. Uh, and so during our typical assessments, our Active Directory security assessments, we've actually highlighted some potential concerns with the VMware environment. Um, so if you're interested in having us take a look at your VMware environment, or at least talking about it, please feel free to reach out. So let's get started. A couple of webcast notes. This webcast is scheduled for one hour and the presentation is about 45 to 50 minutes. Uh, after the presentation, we'll do question and answer Q&A, which may run past the one hour time that's scheduled for it. Uh, that's fine. I'll stay online to answer as many questions as possible. Uh, and during this Q&A, I'll be reviewing the questions uh, that you can submit through the uh, form, either in your web browser, if you've joined through the web browser, or through Teams, if you join through Teams. Um, the moderators will be monitoring those questions and any questions that they see, they'll go ahead and uh, uh, publish those. Once the, pub the question is published, you can actually thumbs up, like those questions, the ones with the most likes or the most popular ones, uh, I will answer first. Also, links to the slides and recording will be posted to the Trimark webcast page at trimark.co slash security webcast in the next day or so, as well as um, posting the recording, the video on our YouTube channel. So let's talk about securing Active Directory, protecting Active Directory administration. So I am Sean Metcalf. I'm the founder of Trimark, and we are a professional services company that helps organizations better secure their Microsoft platform, including the Microsoft Cloud and VMware infrastructure. I'm a Microsoft certified master in Active Directory, and I recently got renewed as an MVP, so I'm happy about that. Uh, and I've spoken at a number of conferences, and I run adsecurity.org. The agenda for today is I'm going to walk through the common administration methods that we see when we work with organizations on assessments and how attackers can compromise the, the administrator credentials based on these common methods. Uh, I'm also going to talk about how to best secure AD administration. I'm going to talk about admin workstations, Microsoft, the tiering model, uh, the pros and cons of the Microsoft Red Forest or Admin Forest or ESAE, whatever you want to call it, as well as a modern approach to this separate uh, secure administration environment. And then close out with some best practices for AD administration. And real quick, I just want to talk about those who have Office 365. Please take time this week to enforce MFA on all your privileged Azure AD and Office 365 accounts. Uh, the best way to do this is with Azure AD Privileged Identity Management, which is PIM, uh, and have that control all of your Azure AD roles. Um, PIM does require Azure AD P2 accounts, but just for those admin accounts that would be in PIM. Um, we do perform a tri uh, Trimark Microsoft Cloud Security Assessment that I mentioned earlier, uh, which focuses on Office 365 and Azure AD. And this is the key recommendation that we provide as part of that engagement. Um, so this is one of the best ways you can secure and protect your Office 365 and Azure AD environment. While this talk is specific to Active Directory, I just want to mention that since it is about secure administration um, for that environment. So where are we? Uh, we've seen improvements in security, though most of this has been focused on deploying tools. And ultimately, Active Directory is often managed the same way as it has always been. Um, these tools have been deployed to provide better insight and guidance and, and detection potentially into what's happening on the in, in, in the in the environment, in the corporate network. Realistically, uh, most administrators, including AD admins, use regular user workstations for all their tasks, from email to web browsing to administration. So on a standard network, you'll have a workstation and there's a number of accounts in the local administrators group, a number of accounts with local admin rights through some sort of software management system, a number of accounts with control of the computer through some sort of security agent or agents. And so you end up with a large number of accounts that have effective admin rights on that one workstation. 
And that doesn't even take into account how many GPOs apply to the workstation and who has uh, the ability to modify those group policies. And so the big concern is here who has control of this workstation. So if an administrator is using this workstation to, to perform administrative tasks, uh, what positive control do they have of this workstation? And the answer often is that they don't. So how do attackers get these uh, credentials? Well, either they compromise a single workstation where they um, dump the credentials on that system and then can get over to the other workstations because they all use the same local admin password, uh, or an admin logs onto the workstation or uses run as, and then those credentials are in LSAS. And then when the attacker has local admin rights, they can dump LSAS. Um, they can use something called password spray where uh, it involves attempting authentication for every user or subset of users with specific passwords, but one at a time. And once they're able to guess that password for one of those users, uh, then they can compromise that account because they have that password. Kerberos uh, involves requesting a Kerberos service ticket for a service account that has an associated Kerberos service principal name or SPIN. Uh, this ticket is saved and moved to the attacker's password cracking system, uh, which then attempts to guess the password and opens the ticket. Once they can guess the correct password and open that ticket, then they know the password for that account. This most or pretty much the entire process of Kerberos can be done offline. So it's effectively an offline password guess attack. And then we have Responder and Inve, which leverage uh, Windows protocol features such as LLMNR and WPAD to intercept and request authentication in order to get credentials on the network. Uh, all this requires is the ability to run one of these tools on a network subnet in order to harvest credentials uh, for that subnet or that network uh, area. Uh, this is what I call the easy button for attacks. Uh, Responder pretty much always gets credentials and very often gets admin credentials. So disabling LLMNR and configuring WPAD to um, break Responder are highly recommended. And I have those recommendations at the end of this uh, slide deck. Red teamers often po find passwords and files. This includes text and Excel files on the desktop or shares. And these files often contain highly privileged account credentials, including those of service accounts, domain admins, shared accounts, et cetera. And then finally, large account or large organizations need to deploy many systems in batches. And the scale of uh, which involved makes this impossible to do manually. So this requires deployment tools, which often use scripts to configure the system. And often these deployment scripts are left behind and they have hard coded username and passwords, which are typically highly privileged. So there's a number of ways attackers can compromise credentials. Let's look at one of the other ways that they can compromise systems. Uh, admin rights on the management system provides a number of benefits to the organization that deployed it. This power can also be leveraged by the attacker as well. Now this is a conceptual diagram of where the potential weak points may be. The admin has control of the management system, management system controls servers, workstations, and very often domain controllers as well. And so this means that if the attacker is able to compromise the admin account or an admin account that has control of that management system or the management system itself, uh, the attacker may be able to push out software, run scripts, run commands on any of the systems that that management system controls. And here I provide a sample, sample list of common systems that Trimark sees in use with agents um, that we typically see deployed in organizations. Uh, the key takeaway here is that a compromise of a management system or an account that can administer the management system uh, could result in compromise of the computers that are managed by that system. This includes workstation servers and domain controllers, and sometimes all three. Uh, in fact, with the case of SCCM, this is almost always all three. So the typical AD administration methods are going to vary depending on the organization. Uh, we have seen pretty much all of these, and very often we've identified weaknesses in how this, this administration uh, method is, is performed. Uh, and most of the time it's because it starts with a regular user workstation. And I just want to call out this top one. Do not run management tools on local workstations. That's not good at all. Um, but a lot of the administration is pretty much using RDP to a server or a domain controller, RDP to a server or domain controller proxy through an RDP gateway, or using a virtual console to DCs using VMware, Hyper-V, remote console, or even enterprise password management system, which controls the credentials or it proxies that connection, uh, which we'll cover in a bit. Most administration today is performed by remotely connecting to a system via RDP or similar uh, from a remote or regular user workstation. 
uh, this involves opening the remote console tool and entering the server name, the username, and the password. Uh, in this example, you can see I'm a regular user on a workstation and about to RDP to a domain controller using an admin account. So I go ahead and uh, click connect, I type in my credentials, and later on after I'm done, I notice that this weird temp file that appeared in the root of the C drive. And if I do some further digging on the system, I was able to identify that there was a WMI event filter, which is effectively a WMI schedule task. And this event filter is configured to fire when the process MSTSC is executed. This is an RDP client executable. And when this is run, WMI will run the PowerShell script called SCCM check, health check, .ps1. Uh, so what does that really do? And it looks like the SCCM health check script actually runs get keystrokes, which is a function from PowerSploit that is a key logger. And the key logging data appears to be sent to this temp file in the C drive. So using PowerShell, we can consolidate this key log file and see the typed username and password. So what this means is if we're using a regular user workstation and we are opening up an RDP client in order to connect to our, our system that we're going to manage, or even using the uh, VMware remote console or remote control software, we are going to connect in and because we're typing the username and password on the system that is the user's workstation, uh, that could be compromised and that data could be extracted. So if the username and password is too easy to compromise, what about smart cards? Well, if the smart cards are used for connecting via RDP, that doesn't improve security as much as you may think since the pin is cached by Windows and this can be extracted using Mimikatz. So as long as a smart card is in the system, connected to the system, the attacker can still use it, often without the user even being aware that it's in use or being used, unless they're looking at the flashing light, which can happen during typical system activity. And if there's a shared admin server in use and all of the admin accounts that use it have admin rights on that system, it just takes compromise of one to compromise all of them. And this is even worse if one of those accounts is an AD admin account. Alexander Korsnikov identified that once you get system rights, you can connect to any existing RDP session. So RDP sessions on shared admin systems must have a configured session expiration and any admin account that connects to the system shouldn't have local admin rights on the system. Uh, but additionally, uh, what he is sh he's showing here in this in this uh, video, a short video file, is that uh, he's leveraging sticky keys in order to connect into uh, the system. Sticky keys is an attack method or persistence method where once you have admin rights on a system, you can configure it so that if you hit the shift key five times at the logon prompt, you get this command window that pops up that is under the context of system on that computer. So by using sticky keys and pulling out that command prompt with system, there's no need to log on to it. We can just connect to any of the sessions that are on that system. One of the things that we see uh, often when we perform, or maybe not often, but when we do perform Active Directory security assessments for customers, we often discover MFA configured in their environment. Uh, I want to point out that MFA is only as good as its configuration. And the most common use of MFA we see is configuring MFA on servers uh, to require a second factor when our RDPing to that server. And Duo is, is what we see most frequently as the MFA solution, so I'm going to use Duo in, in my examples. So one of the things to think about when you are telling users that they have to use MFA is what is the messaging behind how they handle uh, the prompts? Let's say that they wake up in the morning, they get their coffee, uh, or even before they get their coffee, they log on, and back to back, there's two prompts, two log on prompts that, that pop up. Um, what are they supposed to do? Uh, if they're like most people, they're going to tap on the first one and probably tap on the second one before they even realize that there were two prompts that maybe they should have denied the second one. Uh, but that's one thing. But what if you're on your screen, uh, you see approve, and then you see approve again, you see approve again. Maybe you're just going to tap approve three times. Um, and attackers can get in and initiate this, this potential race condition where uh, if they are on the user's workstation and the admin is using that user workstation as a jump point to connect to another system, um, the attacker could create this race condition where when the user actually initiates the valid authentication uh, and MFA prompt, the attacker could do something about the same time or potentially just before the user does that in the background, which would mean that the user would get two or potentially even three prompts. Uh, so the first question is user training. 
how how do they handle the situation? Are they told that if they get a second prompt to deny it, or should they contact security uh, just to see what's going on and to make sure that the request is is valid? So another interesting thing about MFA is that there there is potential to, to subverting the MFA system itself. So here we're going to cover and, and explore the concept of what if an attacker could bypass MFA without anyone noticing. So in this scenario, um, we're going to talk about how MFA is deployed and it leverages uh, some functionality which is actually uh, crossed over with a different business or, uh, workflow that, that's, that's already existing and configured. Uh, so many organizations have a self-service portal, so users, uh, be they employees or contractors, can update specific attributes for their account. Uh, typical MFA configuration is the admin account is associated with the person's user account for the mobile number. And here in the self-service, they have a number of attributes that the user themselves can update. So full name, work phone, mobile phone, uh, department, potentially, et cetera. So in this instance, uh, the user has a mobile phone number configured and the attacker, uh, once the attacker compromises the user account, they can change attributes through the self-service portal for the user uh, because they can impersonate the user. So they're going to change the mobile number uh, to one the attacker controls. And so most of the MFA systems can use text messages or SMS as one method to send code, often the backup method uh, or fallback method in case there's an issue with the app. So we can drill into the MFA prompt window and actually say, text me new codes. So this means that once the attacker changes the mobile number associated with, with MFA for the user's account, the attacker can use MFA to authenticate as a user with the SMS option. So the MFA code is sent to the attacker's number when requested, and the user may not see any anything or any results of this. Um, now I'm mentioning Duo and walking through what that looks like, but other MFA systems have text message SMS as an option as well. Here I, I show a screenshot of Octa. So this slide summarizes the MFA bypass that I just described. We have seen this a few times uh, with customers, so it is something to be aware of, especially if you have a self-service portal and you're using something like Duo. Um, you may want to put in some uh, auditing or uh, second uh, confirmations whenever a user is changing their mobile number, or if, mobile, if the mobile number is part of the MFA system, uh, you may need to require uh, uh, them reaching out to the the help desk in order to change it so their identity can be verified beyond just the authentication on their system. By default, Duo is configured to fail open. Uh, this means that if the Duo client can't connect to the Duo server to initiate the MFA process, the authentication doesn't require MFA. So if the attacker can influence the network connection from the server to the internet, MFA can be turned off for that authentication request. And uh, Noopy has a great blog article um, that was posted a couple years ago describing how this could work. And there's also another option that when enabled, it disables Duo MFA for local accounts if that is even configured. Uh, this means that if an attacker gains admin rights to a system, they could configure a local account and authenticate without MFA, which they may be able to do anyway um, because the local accounts probably don't have that configured uh, anyway. So definitely want to monitor your local accounts. Um, as well as your Duo configuration or MFA, general MFA configuration. Another potential weak point for MFA is the onboarding process. If the identity isn't properly verified, the attacker could potentially onboard a new device for MFA and just use that. And if the attacker doesn't already have MFA and the process involves email, the attacker could go ahead and sign the user up for MFA even if they don't already have it configured. Um, and this is something that that is definitely been seen in the wild, uh, certainly for Office 365 and Azure AD. Um, I don't know specific instances of it being done for on-prem MFA, but I would be surprised if it if it wasn't uh, if it wasn't being done. So the key takeaway here is that MFA configuration for on-prem systems is not a single solution for solving authentication security control concerns, uh, primarily credential theft. Uh, once an attacker gains knowledge of the credentials, MFA configured for RDP doesn't matter since you can you can't native uh, you can't natively require MFA for things like LDAP connections to domain controllers. So ultimately, once an attacker has these AD admin credentials, MFA doesn't really stop them. Another thing that we see uh, often are enterprise password management systems or password vaults, um, and we see these when we're performing Active Directory security assessments. 
When we discover that there's a password management system that may be storing privileged credentials, we look for the potential weaknesses because that's ultimately part of that security posture for Active Directory. And the password system is used to either simply store credentials or completely manage account access, including the password. Uh, often the, uh, the password management system has a reconciliation account in domain admins, which is used to change the passwords for the privileged accounts, which have fallen out of control by the system. Uh, this happens when the account password is changed outside of the password management system's knowledge. Uh, we've also seen that there's custom permissions configured on the admin SD holder objects, so a reconciliation account would be able to only change the password for privileged accounts in AD versus have full AD rights. Uh, so we provide recommendations based on the configuration and the environment that we see. Uh, so the key takeaway here is that when the enterprise password system stores or manages privileged AD credentials, it needs to be protected like a domain controller since it's a key part of the Active Directory security posture. So there are a couple scenarios I want to cover to describe how we typically see uh, enterprise password systems used. So in this first scenario, a person connects to the website uh, and is going authenticates to that password vault, the password system. The person gets the password in, uh, to use with the domain admin account, and copies this into their computer's clipboard. Uh, then they paste the password into the RDP window and they connect to the admin server to start the remote session. So there's a key concern with this configuration since that the password is copied into the local clipboard uh, for the user on this workstation. And we can leverage the PowerSploit function, get clipboard contents to extract data from the clipboard. So very much like the example I provided earlier, uh, we could have something monitoring for uh, uh, the, the activity on the system in order to uh, run this PowerShell function or something similar, which is going to do something similar to what I mentioned earlier with the keylogger, PowerShell keylogger, uh, because when it runs, it copies the data out of the user's clipboard and saves it to a file. So if the attacker is monitoring the web browser's active windows title for common enterprise password management system name like CyberArk or Secret Server, uh, and when, it, when one of these is discovered, um, the, the attacker's WMI system uh, or schedule task or something like that could initiate this function to extract the data from the clipboard. And then along this process, the password is captured um, just by using get clipboard contents. They can uh, also leverage the PowerSploit function get time screenshot to gain additional context such as what account name is used. So if get um, if there is a saved uh, account that's, that's already in the RDP window, we can use get time screenshot to do this. And so here's an example of how we can combine the password from the clipboard with the screenshot of the RDP window. And at this point, the attacker has the necessary information to compromise the account and Active Directory. So in the second scenario, um, the person connects to the password system authenticates, uh, but they are going to then be already uh, have a proxied RDP session through the password vault to the admin server. So they're going to connect to the password vault and then they're going to click on connect, which then proxies that session um, from the web browser through to the admin server. And the password's not available for viewing or checkout, so the password management system um, is that RDP proxy and the only way to get in and leverage that account. Um, and then when the user's done, they log off, um, the password vault goes ahead and disconnects that session. But there's a few concerns with this sort of configuration. For example, what account is used to log on to the workstation um, and then ultimately logged on to, to log on to the password vault to get the credentials. Most of the time we see this as a regular user account. And is MFA used for this authentication of the password vault? Um, not as often it as it should be. Uh, and who manages or administers this password vault system and server? Uh, very often it's just the regular server admins. And then are there network communications limited for connecting to the password vault on the network or is it open from uh, pretty much to the corporate network. It's very often the, the, the case that it's just open to the corporate network. Personally, most of the time, accessing the enterprise password vault is done through the web browser on a regular user workstation. So this means that the same browser that's used for standard web browsing would also be used to access the most privileged credentials for the organization. And if an attacker can surreptitiously install a hidden extension in the browser, this provides options. Um, the attacker can now extract the session token for the user's authenticated session of the password management system and use it elsewhere, or even initialize a hidden tab uh, within that web browser to the password system and perform actions on behalf of the user without them even knowing it. Um, so 
It's a good reason to use a separate web browser for accessing the password vault, or even better, just switch entirely to an admin workstation for um, uh, gaining access to highly privileged credentials in the password vault. Another security concern we discover with password management systems uh, fairly regularly is that the regular is that regular user accounts are members of the password management system administration groups. Um, these often have full control. Uh, they may or may not be configured with MFA. Um, maybe some of them are configured with MFA and some of them aren't, uh, so that can cause some problems. And sometimes password vaults are directly connected to the internet, uh, even very old versions. So we have a list here of the type of security issues that we typically see on enterprise password management systems. Uh, so user accounts used to gain access to highly privileged accounts, typically without requiring MFA. Uh, the fact that these servers are managed like any other, despite storing and managing privileged credentials. Uh, the fact that they're accessible from anywhere on the corporate network and potentially the internet. Um, the sessions for into the password vault should be limited to ensure that a user only has a single session. Um, that can mitigate some of the risk. And since password, enterprise password vaults are software, there can be bugs and security issues in that code. Uh, CyberArk had a major remote code execution vulnerability a couple years ago. Uh, so this can happen. and uh, We have to make sure that they get patched quickly and taken offline if something like this happens because ultimately uh, they hold the keys of the kingdom much like a domain controller. So they need to protect, be protected as such. So here I have some, some captured best practice around this. I've already talked through a number of these, but it comes down to uh, secure administration, secure authentication, uh, protecting the enterprise password vault system or password management system like a domain controller, limiting the communication uh, to it, and then making sure it does get patched. So a common theme that you'll hear me say throughout this webcast and pretty much any other presentation I, I give is that the most important or the best way that you can protect uh, your privileged and admin connections or, or admin credentials is by restricting access to those credentials, isolating them from the network. So requiring administrators to only use admin workstations are one of the best methods to protect privileged credentials, just like how the Batmobile protects Batman. And admin workstations are important because the battles move from the perimeter to the network. And these regular workstations are a common escalation path because the credentials found in these workstations are often used to escalate and elevate privileges. So we want to make sure that we isolate and protect these credentials as much as possible. We want to make sure that only admin accounts can log on to them, that we lock down and restrict access uh, to the systems, including network access, uh, any type of communication with the systems, be they a regular, be they an admin workstation or an admin server. And I have some key items here um, which are listed in order to protect the admin credentials, making sure there's a separate admin account with uh, from a user account. Uh, the admin accounts for AD administration should be different from the admin accounts used for other administration types, so not uh, mixing AD and say Exchange. And Trimark recommends distinct naming standards for each level of administration, AD admins, server admins, workstation admins. Having this distinct naming makes it easier to determine when an account logs on somewhere that it shouldn't. Uh, so you can look at the log and identify, okay, this is an Active Directory admin account. It should not be logging onto this workstation, or we should not see a logon session to this workstation. Uh, you can also restrict where AD admin uh, accounts can authenticate um, using group policy in order to limit that, that logon capability. This is a graphic that I think most people have seen now, which shows the Microsoft tier model, uh, which is the recommended approach for separating systems by type into separate tiers. Uh, key point here is that each tier is managed separately and have their own management infrastructure. So tier zeros is focused only on domain controllers and highly privileged sensitive systems in the environment. Uh, tier one is for server servers, the administration of those servers and management systems, and tier two is for uh, workstation management, workstation admins, uh, their workstations and the management system. So one of the challenges here is that there needs to be a separate management and patching system for each of these tiers that are separated from each other. None of the accounts uh, can, can log in or none of the admin accounts can authenticate and have access to anything outside of their own tier. Uh, so this causes some challenges, but there's some others. Um, and, and there's some really big challenges with this model. It's expensive to deploy, and once deployed, there's significant operational overhead, uh, duplicates infrastructure, is rarely fully implemented, and it needs to focus, really we need to focus on tier zero first. 
Um, instead of working on getting the full tier model deployed, Trimark recommends focusing on getting tier zero configured and fully deployed first. Um, this includes the most privileged systems and accounts. And here we provide a phased approach for deploying admin workstations. Uh, the focus here certainly are the tier zero systems and working down from there, but that's Active Directory administrators, virtual infrastructure admins, cloud admins, server admins, and so on and so forth. Um, so focusing on those areas that are sensitive, including PKI and mainframe admins. I'm asked regularly about the admin forest, also called the red forest. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about the admin forest and, and what that looks like. Uh, the admin forest is officially referred to as the uh, Enhanced Security Administrative Environment, so the ESAE by Microsoft. Uh, this environment is a new AD forest, which is locked down and access to it is severely limited. This is a new Active Directory forest with a high security configuration. It's isolated from the production network. Uh, it has a one-way trust, typically with selective authentication enabled, or maybe even the, the newer PIM trust. Um, in, this role, in this configuration, the production AD admin groups are empty, except for groups with uh, ESAE admin groups. Um, and then there's a lot of additional security lockdown and configuration of the OS um, workstations and authentication. Um, Microsoft's model even has all of the user accounts in this ESAE environment only ever authenticating using smart cards through a separate uh, PKI environment. And these have to have physical systems, uh, including the domain controllers within this admin forest. So there are some pros to this. It effectively isolates the domain admins and other Active Directory admins. Uh, when deployed properly, it can be effective in limiting attacker AD privileged access. Um, but that is really limited to the accounts that are moved over into the red forest or this, this admin forest. Um, it's most effective when managing multiple Active Directory forests because then you have the management account that has access to these other, other forests and can perform that management. Um, so that way you have some, some configuration and control of multiple forests. But it is expensive to deploy. It greatly increases your management overhead and cost, duplicates the infrastructure, and doesn't fix the production AD issues, which is my biggest concern with the admin forest. Um, it doesn't resol resolve these expansive rights over workstations and servers, and the ad AD admin accounts may not properly be discovered, um, such as production AD privileged service accounts, which probably have to stay in the production Active Directory environment. So the admin force is not hidden. It's pretty easy for an attacker to determine if there's an admin force deployed. We just check the trust for a one-way trust where the production AD trusts another uh, Active Directory forest. Uh, we can also look at the uh, membership of the domain administrators group for a group or group that are in another forest and look at the name and of that forest and then we can tie that to the trust so here we can look at the trust configuration using powershell we see selective authentication as an additional security config um, that's configured here and often used for admin forest trust using powershell we identify there's a foreign security principle which is simply a user a computer a security group from another forest there and so deploying an admin force doesn't mean that the production AD environment is secure. Um, all of the tier zero admin accounts should, should be in the admin force, but what's left? Um, there's a focus on production AD privilege accounts. Um, there are going to be some, and these are the things that we look at when we perform an Active Directory security assessment in a production AD environment when we see that there's an admin force connected. We're looking for privilege accounts that are still there. So we may see accounts that have privileges uh, that are left behind or were there from the beginning of AD um, were, and configured with some additional permissions, or uh, they are a member of a group that is uh, added to a local admin group on systems via GPO. And then what are the service counts that are there? What are the rights that they have? What, where are they configured? Where do they log on to? Um, and, and what do they connect to? What are they there for? And then ultimately, what are the domain controller agents? Uh, who has rights on the domain controllers? This is often configured through group policy um, linked to the domain controllers through user rights assignments. Uh, and the backup accounts and servers are a big target because AD has to be backed up. So when we look at the member of backup operators, uh, we see that there's two accounts here. And one is a backup server with AD backup rights, and the second one is an AD backup service count. Well, the backup server shouldn't actually have these rights. It doesn't need it. It's just the service count that needs it. But this gives the attacker two potential options. Um, they can compromise the backup server, which is probably a good idea because then they'd have access to the actual backups, or just the service count, which may give them access to backups. 
but may also give them the ability to get onto the domain controller. So I just want to close out that admin forest uh, section with some of the issues that we, we typically identify. Um, one of the key ones is that having the admin forest doesn't automatically fix and resolve the all of the production AD uh, potential security issues. Um, it doesn't resolve the addition, the permissions that are configured within that environment. Um, the agents on the DCs are a target. Uh, I've actually worked with an internal red team, and one of the ways that we were compromised the production Active Directory environment was going after the backup system. Once we compromised the backup system, we were able to jump onto the domain controllers in the production AD, and at that point, we had full access to everything. Uh, we didn't need the red forest or the admin forest. Um, that we could completely ignore, and that wasn't what the goal was. The goal was to get access to data and work through that Active Directory environment, figure out what was there. So there's a better way. Um, so one of the things that uh, is, seems to be picking up some, some momentum is the concept of a cloud admin forest, uh, or a cloud ESAE. Uh, this is a effectively leverage Azure Active Directory as your quote unquote admin forest, uh, or secure administrative environment. Flip the switch to enable security defaults, so legacy authentication is disabled and additional security is required for admin tasks. Um, have separate admin workstations that are only joined to Azure AD, not your on-prem AD. Uh, these systems are only managed and controlled by Intune. Uh, the accounts are all required to use MFA, so Microsoft Authenticator or similar, and preferably FIDO2, which Microsoft calls passwordless. So we're going to enforce MFA and restrict access to Azure AD and Office 365, uh, the environment there with conditional access policies. And VPN access and even access to the domain controllers can be controlled via certificates deployed via Intune. Um, but ultimately, this is your secure environment. Uh, you can use this for on-prem AD management and cloud service management. Um, and really, there, there is no admin force with this concept. It's just, a, it's not a true admin force since there's no trust. Active Directory is not really Active Directory, so there is no AD force trust. Um, so using Azure AD as the admin force means that these Azure AD accounts can't be used to directly manage on-prem AD, but they can provide a secure environment from which the admins can manage the production uh, AD force. This configuration solves the secure administration environment concerns. Um, and then the AD admin accounts are still in the production AD environment and require the standard uh, protections. One of the nice things about Intune is there's a setting under endpoint protection um, under Microsoft Defender Application Control where you can enforce application control code integrity policies and only trust apps with good reputation. These are the apps that Microsoft's intelligence security graph is aware of that are commonly used. So any apps or executables that are not known by Microsoft will not be allowed to run. Um, so this is a good way to quickly lock down uh, systems via Intune, and um, then you can leverage additional policies to providing uh, solid security. So uh, with this, you can uh, enable and enforce uh, BitLocker, so that way there's a boot pen, um, and also implement some of the additional policies through Intune uh, that lock down the system with some of the recommended Microsoft uh, security configurations. Always some drawbacks. Um, so this does require a new uh, additional uh, Microsoft Azure Office 365 tenant, or if you want to use another cloud, that could be done too, but a number of the details change. It's a new environment, so there's a cloud learning curve if you're not familiar with some of these concepts. Uh, the management overhead associated with a new environment is there because it's a new environment, um, but it's still simpler overall compared to another Active Directory environment. Um, probably one of the bigger drawbacks is that if you have multiple forests that you need to manage, there is no trust with Azure AD, uh, so each AD force being managed still requires an AD admin account for management of that forest. With it, that account has to stay within that forest, um, and it does require full trust in insofar as you trust the cloud environment and the management of it and the system itself um, as infrastructure. So, but realistically, you probably already trust cloud services and management if you're using cloud services today. There are benefits: uh, the cost of the accounts in a new or additional Microsoft Office Azure uh, 365 or Microsoft Azure Office 365 tenant is cheaper than a Red Forest, Admin Forest, ESAE deployment. Uh, it's easy to implement security controls, MFA, security configuration via Intune, et cetera. Uh, it's not group policy. It's not a one-to-one -one group policy. So there's some things that are a little trickier to do, but the core security components and features are done um, and available through Intune. Uh, and it doesn't ensure the true separation of on-prem AD and, and the admin force. So if there is a breach, if there is a problem with your on-prem AD, um, 
certainly the accounts would be affected in that AD, but this environment itself would be uh, safe from that breach and would not be affected by it. And of course, you can leverage this for cloud service administration and other things as well. So in closing, there are a number of AD administration best practices. Um, secure administration, we want separate accounts. We want AD admin accounts only using admin workstations, only logging on to admin servers, domain controllers. Uh, we want to block our AD admin groups from logging on to workstations and servers via group policy, um, and then limit protocols and limit access. Uh, one of the best ways to protect our admin accounts and admin systems is through a new secure top level OU in the domain. So we can call this management, AD management, administration, something like that. Uh, we can modify the security on this OU so that authenticated users can't view it. Um, we can also block GPO inheritance, so none of the GPOs at the domain level apply down to this OU. Um, and we can, we can uh, limit what sort of effects we would have from that. Uh, we can create OUs within this OU structure for servers, workstations, accounts, groups, all related to administration of Active Directory, um, and place them into this OU structure. But we want to ensure that only the AD admins have the modify rights to the structure and modify owner rights to GPOs linked to this OU. Um, and then I have some uh, recommendations about securing Active Directory in different levels. So here are the level one, the easier things to do, the things that you should work on now if you are, haven't already done these things. Um, level two is a little more challenging, um, takes a little bit more time. It probably requires a little more investigation in your environment to ensure that you have what you need in that environment to make sure that these can be configured. Um, and then third, one of the, the bigger things that take longer. And I just want to call out here the last one, implement, implement network segmentation, uh, something we pretty much never see. But I want to give you a tip on how you can actually start working on that today. Um, start this by reserving, start this process by reserving your IP ranges or VLANs by device type. So identify this IP range or VLAN for your routers, another one for switches, another one for domain controllers, another one for servers, workstations, printers. And even in a fairly large environment, through this process over the next five to 10 years, you can actually get these devices as new devices are stood up. Um, through attrition, uh, you'll have more of these devices in these ranges where it's obvious and known where they are. So that way you can start mapping out and understanding the communication flows and pathways of, of what these devices are and how they communicate with each other. And then when you see anomalies like a printer trying to reach out to everything, then that can be more easily flagged uh, versus today where it's tougher to tell what a device actually is based on where it is in the network. Um, this is definitely a concept that should be done in the cloud. If you're moving to Azure, AWS, Google Cloud Platform, any of the IaaS services where you are spinning up VMs, you wanna make sure that you have the effective configuration uh, where you have zones for each of these device types and you're controlling access through them. Um, because you're spinning, you're standing it up now. This is the best time to do it is in the beginning. And then ultimately we want to protect the admin credentials. So like I said, making sure that our admins only log on to prove admin workstations and servers, um, add all these admin accounts to protect a user group, which full, full capability uh, requires 2012 R2 DCs. Um, and the admin workstations and servers, we want to limit access, removing NetBIOS over TCP IP, which should be um, I believe the case on the current versions of Windows 10, disabling LMNR, disable WPAD, and then some additional mitigations such as enabling auditing of NTLM and SMB. Make sure your SMB V1s are disabled as much as possible and at least audit for it. Um, you want to make sure that you're monitoring things and sending that data back to your SIM so you have central um, understanding of uh, or understanding what's going on in your network from a central uh, perspective. Uh, and then we did publish our Invoke Trimark AD Checks PowerShell script uh, in the last month to help you identify uh, potential problematic AD configurations. Now it's optimized for a single domain Active Directory Forest. It's not too large. Um, and we have a blog post at this link that, that has some additional information and recommendations that we have around that. So uh, in summary, traditional AD administration must evolve with the threats to pr effectively protect AD. Uh, most organizations have done something, uh, often not enough to protect their environment though. And I list a couple of priorities here of what to do. Removing accounts and service accounts from AD privilege groups, protecting and isolating AD admin credentials by ensuring that credentials are limited to specific systems. Uh, so we have our new hub.trimarksecurity.com uh, site where all the slides and videos and posts are, are located. Um, and I'm going to switch over to look at Q&A. 
see what questions we have queued up. So please give me a moment while I do that. And just a reminder, we do have an upcoming uh, webcast in September, uh, which where I'll be talking about what happens when Active Directory is breached, how attackers can compromise Active Directory, uh, what typically happens through a process of recovering from a breach. Obviously, the first st step is reaching out to a reputable incident response company, um, but I'll talk to you about my experience and maybe a couple anecdotes of what I've seen uh, during the re breach recovery process. Okay, uh, let's see. The first question, what about cloud-based MFA solutions? What have you have you encountered any way to bypass? Um, I believe there have been some bypasses for cloud-based MFA solutions uh, over in the past. Um, one of probably the, the most obvious one is using something like uh, EvilGenix, uh, which I talked about in the webcast uh, back in May about securing Office 365, uh, where someone could, if they're able to influence what uh, link the uh, admin goes to or is able to influence uh, where they're where they're connecting to again to to a, a server or website of the attackers control uh, they could set up within the middle of that communication and a proxy that connection between the admin and uh, office 365 or the cloud app and then when the MFA request comes through then they just proxy that request so that that way they, they have that information as well. Uh, my understanding is FIDO2 or passwordless is, is much more resilient to the sort of person in the middle interception uh, and, and should be uh, more effective and, and have the ability to, um, to restrict that sort of access. But beyond that, I'm not, I'm not certain of others. I'll have to take a look to see what, um, see what might be there probably for a, a future Office 365 webcast. Let's see. That's a good question. Would you recommend using a VM as a uh, an admin system? Make sure I read that correctly. Just my, check my sorting. Um, yeah, would you recommend using a VM as an admin workstation? I would not recommend using a VM as your admin workstation um, because the host OS, or, or unless, okay, I'll caveat that, unless the host OS is the OS that is actually the uh, uh, either just a basic host OS where nothing is being done on it and you have a, a VM for administration and a VM for user activity. Uh, but if you are using your workstation for user activity and a VM is what you're using for administration, you have the same sort of problem. So I don't recommend that you um, configure a VM as your admin workstation. Um, how to use an admin workstation while working from home? That's a great question. Um, and I believe that uh, uh, probably that there are a lot of people that are doing that right now. Um, so I'm sure that the people that are doing it right now have a better understanding of how that's being done currently. Uh, but I would certainly recommend an admin workstation with a BitLocker pin for boot up so that way it's secured. Um, special VPN access which requires MFA uh, connecting in to the, to the um, corporate network. Um, the other thing that you can do is you can just basically use that admin workstation as kind of a jump system where you're using it to then connect to an admin server and the admin server has the tools that you need to do the uh, do the actions. You can uh, configure advanced auditing on the admin server and only allow communication from the admin server into the uh, the domain controllers or the other systems that are, are you're going to be administering. Um, so that's typically the kind of configuration that I recommend. Um, as far as working from home, uh, be aware of your surroundings. Uh, you probably don't want to be necessarily outside where someone could could monitor what you're doing. Uh, you'd probably want to be in a, a room <laughs> inside the house or apartment where uh, um, your, your screen is not visible through the window. Basic operational security concerns and, and, and requirements around that. But I'd say for securing the administration um, and the admin workstation while working from home, um, admin workstation, a true admin workstation is a separate physical device. So there'd be the admin workstation and a regular user workstation side by side effectively. Uh, what's the best way to secure WMI on domain controllers? 
uh, probably leveraging the built-in or the host base uh, firewall, the Windows Defender firewall, I believe it's called now. Uh, and with that, you can uh, effectively control who can access WMI. So you can effectively disable WMI to all, the entire network and only allow WMI connections from a specific admin subnet, as well as maybe a, specific, a couple of specific systems that need to do WMI calls to, Act Direct, uh, to the Active Directory domain controllers. Um, we typically recommend that domain controllers are locked down where the management protocols are not accessible from the corporate network at large, but an admin subnet. So things like RDP, uh, WMI, WinRM, the, the, those are restricted. Uh, what's the recommended method to fully disable WPAD? I'm going to take this as a trick question. Um, WPAD is one of the most challenging things to fully lock down and control. Um, and there are entire articles uh, that, that have been based on, or, you know, working on locking that and controlling it. Um, my, my, Microsoft has put out a patch in the past couple of years. I don't think the patch fully resolved the issue. I know that uh, based on what I've seen and what uh, customer feedback, even the steps that have been used in the past couple of years to disable WPAD haven't disabled it fully. Um, but from what I've seen, at least the steps that have been implemented have been enough to frustrate um, things like responders, so they don't work fully and it, um, do do add some barriers uh, in order for them to work uh, as effectively as they have. Uh, let's see, have you seen any pitfalls with organizations attempting to implement just-in-time or JIT administration? Um, I mean, obviously, the, the, the core pitfall of this is finding a system that's going to work well for you, um, but the the other one is you're going to have to wait for replication to occur if, if there's a situation where it's it's updating a group that then has to replicate to a domain controller halfway around the world or something like that. Um, the uh, I've worked in an or, uh, organization that had a large deployment of domain controllers around the world uh, and we, we had a configuration where we were manually adding ourselves to groups and removing ourselves at the end of the day. Uh, so I know this kind of just in time where at least when you start your day and you're, you you um, are uh, need to get access, you are adding yourself into a group that then gives that access and uh, you're able to uh, gain control or access through that can be done. Um, I'd say the biggest challenge right now is finding a system that works well and is easy to use. Um, the just in time type systems uh, like Azure AD PIM and Office 365 just aren't as I'm not aware of, of, of many good ones um, that, that are available right now. All right, so let's see. Next question. Okay, how to properly transfer operational data between isolated admin workstation user, uh, his user workstation, flash drive? That's a great question. And so the, the concern is gonna be that there's certain things that you're doing or certain things that you need to take a snapshot of or something like that. Um, the Active Directory, you can see a lot of things as a regular user. So um, on your user workstation, you should be able to see pretty much everything that you would need to actually modify on your admin system. Um, but there are definitely circumstances and situations where you would need to um, be able to uh, move data. Uh, so I would say something you could use a system where um, basically you are uploading something to, uh, for example, a secured SharePoint site uh, from that from that admin system and then pull that down to your user workstation. Um, I don't necessarily I don't know that I would recommend a flash drive per se, um, but definitely a um, a controlled environment for file sharing at, at sort of an administrative level where it's scanned and checked um, and access is, is uh, limited between those two and probably restricted to certain types of files or certain file types. Um, probably would have some, some mechanism uh, or some specific sharing uh, configuration where from the admin system you can upload but from the uh, or and, and modify and, and add new but from the user side, the user account, you wouldn't be able to add to it. You would just be able to, to download things. That's a good question. All right, let's see. Is it possible to implement MFA again at the password vault level for the connection between the target server and the password vault? I'm not aware of that. Um, I think that would probably break uh, that. The way that we normally see it is that from the actual workstation, the person MFAs to the password vault, 
and then the password vault uh, when they click connect it pat proxies over through rdp to the the server um, that password that the password vault is managing typically gets changed after that session disconnects so that password is rotated um, so I don't know that that would provide um, a ton of benefits from the from the initial uh, beyond that uh, tons of security benefits on top of the existing configuration. Uh, isn't remote WMI a dependency from DC to DC and client to DC communication? Wouldn't disabling WMI on DC impact that communication? No, for standard Active Directory clients, there should be no um, requirement for WMI communication. Um, WMI is the Windows Management in Instrumentation um, functionality, and even to, to do WMI calls against the domain controller or a system, um, typically, I'm going to say most of the time, they require admin rights. So the, for me, there should be good, no good reason for any workstations to be doing WMI calls to domain controllers. Um, there might be a couple circumstances where there's a monitoring system that is doing WMI against the domain controller, uh, something like SCOM, Microsoft SCOM, or uh, SCCM that, that might have to do that. But I'm not, a, I, and I'm not aware of DC to DC uh, WMI communication, but I'd have to double check that. Um, but even DC to DC is fine because they would all be in the same sort of uh, trust zone or, or level of, of uh, trust of, of that area. Um, so let's see, what else? Hi, Sean, do you recommend uninstall PowerShell Windows feature on workstations? I think that I can maintain this tool only on authorized admin workstations. No, I don't usually recommend an uninstall or remove or disable or block PowerShell per se on uh, regular user workstations. Um, first of all, PowerShell is often leveraged by a wide variety of system management tools, including SCCM. Um, you could potentially ACL the PowerShell.exe, PowerShell underscore ISE, uh, exe from user access and and so that way only an administrator could be able to use it so that, i mean we've seen that before uh, but ultimately powershell is is a dll um, so calling the executable to get to the dll is one way to do it the attacker can usually just drop an executable that calls the powershell dll anyway if they want to and i think a lot of the attacks or, or um, a lot of attackers are, are shifting over to net anyway so they use they're dropping executables um, so I, I don't know that that would provide uh, a ton of benefits. Let's see. Again, thank you for the questions and thanks for joining. This is a, a great, um, great way to interact and and with uh, conferences not not being what they were, uh, it's it's a good way to uh, be able to connect with everyone and and have these conversations. Uh, so do you see the Kerberos protocol ever getting an update and what new implementations would you like to see? That's a great question. Um, I don't see the Kerberos protocol, at least from the Microsoft perspective, ever getting an update uh, other than maybe bug fixes or security fixes. Um, there's a number of things that probably should be fixed or could be fixed, uh, such as how um, the system itself handles um, uh, passwords as a secret or at least password representations of the secret. My understanding is that the original Kerberos uh, protocol from MIT did not have that. It was a, a random string effectively. Um, and in order to move from NT4 to Active Directory, um, in order to uh, maintain legacy and make things easier for moving to Kerberos, uh, I think it was decided to use the, uh, the, the password hash as part of that. So yeah, there's, there's a, a lot of things that, that definitely could be improved, but I think that I mean, when you look at server 2019 and the release of that and the Active Directory updates, there were no Active Directory updates that came with server 2019. Um, well, technically there was sir, the, one, the, the version store, which is how um, Active Directory stores some information in memory while it satisfies queries, um, was expanded and there were some operational and performance improvements, but that that's it. So uh, I don't expect there's gonna be any, any real updates to Active Directory in the future. Uh, I think Microsoft's pretty much decided and stamped it as done. Um, and then there's probably going to be some minor stuff uh, as we as we move forward. Now, it may be interesting to see as Active Directory um, itself uh, becomes more popular, maybe in the managed AD space from the cloud provider's perspective, we may see some interesting things there, but I don't, I don't see much from Kerberos uh, getting updated or even really any core functionality of, of Active Directory. Uh, let's see. Uh, have you seen organizations successfully running Microsoft's privileged access management for Active Directory domain services or mostly third-party products like CyberArk? Uh, we have personally at Trimark have seen primarily um, things like CyberArk or Secret Server. 
Um, we haven't seen Microsoft Privilege Access Management, I mean, per se in the modern sense. Um, some of the team have worked with um, Microsoft's MIM, Microsoft Identity Management, management um, the, uh, the other names of it. So it was MIS for, for a while um, and, and the management around that. Certainly there's hooks in server, uh, the newer server OSs for, for the, the PAM solution kind of sort of suite. Um, but no, we haven't seen that specifically. It, it does have some requirements around um, the configuration and things along those lines, which the larger companies that would have potentially the resources to get that configured and deployed and, and working well um, often don't have all the operating system levels on the DCs and um, the force level up to the right to the right point in order to be able to, to leverage that. And let's see. Okay, so uh, so the admin workstations have some access to the internet. Um, I would say that the admin workstations should only have uh, should be allowed access to what they require. So if an admin workstation is being used to manage cloud services, then it should have access to the Microsoft Cloud per se, but not the internet at large. Um, if there are specific sites that are not in, within the corporate network boundaries that are required for um, administration, then those could be included. Um, but really, it, it should be restricted. Uh, what's the most secure approach to allowing security scanning tools to do their work in an AD environment? I would say the most secure approach to doing this is to isolate each of the, uh, the service accounts associated with these tools to only the tier that they need to scan. So our standard recommendation at Trimark uh, for when we see vulnerability scanning accounts and domain admins is to, as best as possible, split those out into a, a service account to scan workstations, a service account to scan uh, servers, and a service account to scan domain controllers. Um, that way those scans uh, and the service accounts that are used, if there's any sort of hiccup with the system or problem or even unconstrained delegation in the environment, uh, and you're just scanning works ser servers, then that's what that, that frame of um, or, or area of potential exposure is. Um, but it, obviously, least privilege is the answer. The problem is that a lot of with, a lot of the vulnerability scanning accounts and even inventory scanners uh, say they need local admin rights in order to get the information that they need. And that may be true, um, but your mileage is going to vary per, per solution. I would say um, the best thing to do is to push back on the vendor, ask them what the actual requites are, or the rights are that are required and then work from that in order to determine what, what to do. Okay, um, the most difficult part is to embrace the change. Any tips to force old folks to change their practice? Um, that's a great question. Uh, so the, um, the difficult part is the change of, change of mentality. And I think one of, the, one of the things to have the discussion around is here are the ways that attackers are compromising how we are currently doing Active Directory administration. Here's what is happening today. Um, if I were an Active Directory administrator today, I would not want my admin account to be the one that shows up on the report that says this is how we were breached. Not that it would necessarily be my fault, but it would be absolutely my fault if the organization said this is what we're going to do and how to secure our administration because we don't want to have to deal with the effects of a breach um, and the cost of the breach. And I, as the administrator, decided, well, I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to continue doing things the way that I, I did them. Um, I'd say that the, the common ways that attackers are compromising environments are getting the admin credentials because they're logging on or being used places where they shouldn't be, like standard user workstations, or even just putting passwords in files and keeping them on the user workstation, which is another problem. So a password management system, even like 1Password or um, a key pass or something like that should be used to, to store them. So at least there's some protection around it. Um, let's see, uh, Sean, how far will we administration be able to apply Red Force type of security isolation to our Azure instances as we migrate from on-prem to cloud? Um, I think there's a few different questions here, Jeff. Um, so I'm going to try to unpack this as best I can. Um, I would say that from the perspective of a true Red Force and Admin Force as Microsoft defines it, um, the Azure Cloud, Azure IaaS or any Cloud IaaS do not meet those requirements per se. 
uh, because technically from a strict definition of what ESAE is supposed to be, they're supposed to be physical systems. So the physical systems obviously blow that out of the water. Um, there are also some additional control planes that come in where uh, part of things that we look at with the Trimark Act Director Security Assessment is who has control to different management systems or, uh, for example, the VMware system that domain controllers are on or even Azure, AWS, GCP. Um, so I did a uh, blog post and, and actually talked about it in a webcast uh, in uh, June, well, last, last month, two months ago. Um, in, in, at the end of May, I, I talked through um, how it wasn't clear that global administrators could also gain access to the Azure side of things um, through a switch, which was fairly hidden until Microsoft added security defaults and put it right above that switch or right underneath it. Um, so even if you have Office 365 as just a pilot, but you're not really using it yet, and you have glo some global admins, uh, but you're using Azure and you have been using Azure for years, any of those global admins uh, accounts get compromised, they can then jump into any of your Azure subscriptions associated with that tenant. So I think from the Red Forest type of security isolation, you could probably push in that direction if you were looking at, say, the separate tenant approach that I talk about in the, in the cloud admin for, so to speak. Um, you could leverage a separate Azure tenant to set something up like that. Um, one of the slides that didn't quite make the cut for this, for this webcast was talking about using managed AD uh, or a hosted Active Directory environment, um, such as AWS Managed Active Directory or GCP Managed Active Directory or uh, Microsoft's Azure AD Domain Services, uh, where effectively the cloud provider spins up, an, uh, spins up the domain controllers for you. You don't get domain admins, you don't get domain controllers, or you don't get access to the domain controllers, but you have an AD environment. Um, you could potentially use that as a trust and, and have some things around that. I just ran out of time for, for exploring that. So. Um, I'm sure I'll have uh, some more talks uh, or webcasts that I'll do in the future around some of these topics and dive in a little bit deeper around them. Um, so I think it's it's probably a little more complicated, of course, as the cloud is when it comes to figuring out uh, the management and, and maintaining um, and protecting the administrative credentials. Uh, with the Azure AD approach, I wanted to find something that would be relatively straightforward, relatively simple, um, something that wouldn't have a huge lift in order to do and wouldn't have the management overhead of what Active Directory involves. Um, you, and you have an, a, a, an admin forest, now you have another forest with accounts and group policies and things that need to be looked at. You need to make sure, sure that the uh, network controls around it are very secure and protected. Um, in Azure, you, you have to trust who the subscription, subscription level admins are, um, tenant admins, any of the groups that are configured and, and that has to be very well restricted. And maybe if the people who are the AD admins control all that, then you have some protection and control around it. Um, but I'm not, I'm not sure about it um, as far as what that looks like. And I'm not 100% confident in a Red Forest type in say Azure or AWS or um, or GCP with, without some additional controls or something else providing uh, additional protections around that at this time. Okay, so good question here. Workstation uh, using regular credent credentials to uh, RDP to the admin workstation. Um, so using regular credentials or privileged credentials. So what's the better bet? Um, I would say that anytime you're, you're typing in uh, admin credentials or privileged credentials on your user workstation, that is a losing bet. Um, including when you're typing them into RDP. I don't even like to see um, that happening even when MFA is configured. Um, I, I would much prefer to see an admin workstation. So uh, let, let's call it different degrees of bad uh, where just using, okay, really bad would be that your user account is your admin account um, in Active Directory, which of course we've seen. Um, then next level of bad is that there's a user account logged on to the workstation. There's an admin account that's used to RDP to um, the server, the domain controller to do administration. Uh, next level up from that, somewhat better, is putting MFA on that. Now that's not really gonna stop the attacker because once they have the username and password, then they can do stuff with that. Um, so ultimately having some sort of admin workstation is going to be the best bet. Now you could have a configuration, as I mentioned earlier, where you have a workstation that is either your admin workstation with a user VM potentially, or a system that has an admin VM and a user VM, um, in which case you could, you could do your management through that admin VM and then use your user VM to perform user tasks. 
Um, or you could even have a um, VDI environment just for administration, um, provided that it can be secured at the level that uh, the organization is comfortable with and can accept whatever risk is associated with that. Um, so uh, at this point, uh, I want to say thank you very much. That's been my time. I really appreciate your time uh, in joining us for this webcast. Uh, we will we will start this back up again in the fall in September. Um, thank you very much and uh, take care.